Hi there, it's been a while. I didn't realize that so many people were going to watch the videos or I would have continued sooner. Um, I know that the videos can be quite long, so I kind of assumed that most people would give up, but it's always easier to, I guess, follow along more so than read it yourself. So today is chapter five, See, Think, Do. In the previous four chapters, you began developing your smart driving skills by learning the basics of driving being a thinking driver, maintaining a safe vehicle, understanding signs, signals, and road markings, knowing the rules of the road. This chapter will bring all of those concepts together and describe how to use them as part of a see, think, do, a driving strategy that can help you be a safe and competent driver. See, you want to scan for hazards, pay attention to other road users and the areas where hazards could occur. So this is actually quite important. Um, after driving for so long, I automatically do it. I know when you're first starting to drive, doing shoulder checks and all of that can seem like a waste of time and kind of something that you're just pretending to do so that your instructor sees you do it. However, um, in the future, you will become more aware just because you will notice that people pop out of everywhere when you're least expecting it. <laughs> and not hitting them is definitely um, a need to do basis because <laughs> you don't want to do that. Um, you want to think which hazards are most dangerous. So if you're driving on the highway and it's rainy and you're thinking about, okay, if someone's going to stop in front of me, do I either try to slam on my brakes and not hit them or should I just go to the left and see like, you know, you're not going to hit them, but you might hurt yourself only. But at the end of the day, that's going to save you money and also, of course, other people. So just kind of knowing what your best option is if you are in a dangerous situation already. Same with snow. I know we don't get a lot of snow here in BC, but um, when you're first learning how to drive in it, I definitely recommend going to a parking lot, doing a hard brake or doing a hard turn and just see what your car does. Because I know for my car, if I do a hard turn, I'm going to slide at least three feet. And if I do a hard brake, then I know how far I need to stop in advance if there's someone in front of me. Um, again, if you're going down hills, that hard brake is going to change. There was one time where I was going down the hill in the snow and I was going to turn left. And then I realized my brakes were not working. So I opted to go straight instead. So those are kind of the things you need to know when you're driving like long term, not so much just on your L test. Um, and then do maneuvers to keep yourself and others safe. Just like I was saying, plan ahead. If you know that the road is dangerous, just kind of try to think ahead at what you would do um, to cause the least damage. So um, whenever you drive, your eyes should be scanning the areas around you to gather information. Good observation means knowing how to look and where to look. The next step is hazard perception, knowing what to look for. So if you're going through a neighborhood with like a park around, you're going to be looking for people or cars coming out into the road, maybe pets. Um, whereas if you're going on the highway, I know in Langley here, we have quite a few deer. And so if I'm driving at dawn or dusk, I'm looking for deer and kind of that kind of thing. Again, you're going to pick it up with experience, but just being aware of what to look for in different areas where you are is definitely going to help you in the long run. And again, if you're gonna do a hard stop, always look behind you to make sure the person behind you is also doing a stop because otherwise you're gonna probably have to do something else. Again, you learn it with experience. Um, now I can pretty much autopilot most of my day, <laughs> but um, it definitely took a while to get there. So you're you in the driver's seat. You're driving along a city street, scanning well ahead. You check your mirrors. The car behind you is keeping well back. There's an intersection ahead. You carefully scan the intersection to see if it's clear before you proceed. Again, it seems like if the light is red, nobody's going to come. But if you're the first one through a green light, always check left to right because you never know if someone's going to run that red and you do not want to be T-boned. <laughs> Strategies, the observation cycle. Always keep your eyes moving while you're driving. Look well ahead, scan from one side of the road to the other, checking for potential hazards. Glance in your rear view and your side mirrors to keep track of what's happening behind you. Then start all over again. You should complete the whole cycle every five to eight seconds. So this is, of course, best practice. 
five to eight seconds. If you're driving, there's no one around you, that's not necessary. If you're driving through the city, it is a good idea because things can change so quickly, especially for example, Christmas shopping right now. If you're driving past the mall, you're gonna get a cut off 100% of the time. So this routine would be good when driving around like very um, congested areas. So warning, you don't wanna overdrive your ability to see. You should always be able to stop within the distance you can see. Observing ahead. Research shows that new drivers spend so much time looking at the road just in front of their vehicles, they often miss the hazards further ahead. Make sure that you know what's coming up by scanning at least 12 seconds ahead. This means look one to two blocks ahead in the city driving a half kilometer ahead on the highway. This will give you time to prepare for potential hazards instead of being taken by surprise. So for example, myself, I usually look at the next light coming up because if that light is gonna turn red, then everybody's gonna stop. So then that's gonna prepare me to not be like slamming on my brakes and surprising the people behind me. Whereas if I'm on the highway, I'm looking for brake lights because if I see a brake light, that means everybody's gonna do a halt. But as they said, when you're a new driver, you're just focusing on driving. <laughs> so don't beat yourself up if you can't look that far ahead. As you look ahead, scan left to right so that you can see what's happ happening along the sides of the road. If you see cars parked by the side of the road, be careful. A child might be walking between them or a door might be about to swing open. Driving tip. By looking ahead, you can avoid sudden stops, which increases your fuel consumption. With the prices of fuel today, you definitely want to conserve that. <laughs> um, so this is just a picture showing you your peripheral vision and how important it is. For example, if there's no median and the car on the other side veers towards you, that's always good to know before it happens. I have a couple of friends that still don't like to drive in this middle lane just because of the possibility of that. Myself, um, I don't mind as long as, like I said, I try to keep my vision up here. So if I see anything funky happening, I'm well prepared by the time they get to my side. The easiest things to see are the things that are right in front of you. It's in your central vision, but it's also important to pay attention to things outside of your central vision. Peripheral vision allows you to see more than what's directly in front of you. So yeah, just expanding your field of vision, it can be difficult. Again, comes with experience and time, but just be aware. Observing behind. Your side and rear view mirrors let you see what's happening behind you. Adjust them to get the best possible view. Look in each mirror about five to eight seconds and pay attention to what you see. If you're a new driver, you're usually driving in your parents' car. So sometimes it can be hard to readjust your mirrors every time. I know it's annoying, but it is quite important because just by moving those mirrors, you are eliminating your blind spots. And that is so important because there's been a couple of times where I've just gotten a weird feeling and I double check and I see someone that was in my blind sec spot like three seconds before. And of course, you don't want to hit anyone. Review mirrors. Look in your review mirror before you slow down or stop. Will the cars behind you have space to stop? If not, you may need to take action. So this is just what I was saying before. You have to be aware that you are not the only person on the road. If you're going to slam on your brakes, you need to be aware of the people behind you because they might not have been expecting that. Side view mirrors. Use your side view mirrors whenever you are planning to change your road position or direction. When you're pulling away from the right side of the road, you need to check your left mirror to make sure there's no cars coming up from behind. If you're making a lane change to the right, check your right mirror to make sure there's space to move in. Blind spots. Even when your mirrors are properly adjusted, there are large areas that you can't see in your mirrors. These are called blind spots. These are the most dangerous blind spots are to your side. So like I was saying, there's this usually this bar here that holds your windshield in place. And those are going to be your most dangerous blind spots because those are the ones that you actually don't see. Typically, you're going to notice behind yourself or in front of yourself whenever you're driving. But the bars, depending on what car you have, they can cause bigger blind spots, so it's good to be aware of that. Each vehicle has smaller blind spots in the front and back, as well as the two large blind spots on the side. Their size depends on the shape and size of your vehicle. Try sitting in your vehicle and find the areas you can't see even when you use your mirrors. If you want, you could always have like a friend or a family member just walk around the car slowly and you'll kind of see those blind spots. So some vehicles, most of the new vehicles nowadays are equipped with blind spot, sorry, blind spot detectors 
and or backup cameras. Um, another thing that cars can have is it's like a beep. So if something comes too close to you or you go too close to something, it'll be like beep, 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 beep. And that will warn you that there's something you haven't seen or something that you're getting close to. While these can help you detect hazards in the blind spots or behind the vehicle, they do not replace the need to turn your head and do a shoulder check or look behind. Again, it's always good to look with your eyes versus relying on technology, especially when you're learning to drive because when you're in your tests, they usually cover up the cameras so that you're not able to access those. And shoulder check whenever you plan to change your direction or road position. When you're gonna turn right, for example, quickly check to the right to make sure no one's in that space and don't forget to do a mirror check and a shoulder check before opening your door to get out of your vehicle. A cyclist or another vehicle could be coming up beside you. So anything you don't want someone else to do to you, don't do to anyone else, essentially. <laughs> so this is a shoulder check. Do a shoulder check to certain your blind spot is clear before you move your vehicle into another lane or a different direction. Look at least 45 degrees over your shoulder in the direction you plan to move. If you're going to move to the right, check over your right shoulder. If you're going to move to the left, check over your left shoulder. Again, when you're learning to drive, it can be hard to even turn your eyes away for a second because you're so focused on staying in the middle of the lane. However, when you are in your driver's test, I do recommend that you do this really obnoxiously because if they don't see you doing it really obnoxiously, you can lose marks for not doing that shoulder check. Um, so even if you aren't shoulder checking, just fake it till you make it because that's going to make a difference um, in your test for sure. So strategies, making your move. Check your mirrors and do a shoulder check whenever you plan to pull out from the side of the road, pull over to the side of the road, change lanes, turn left or turn right. So if you're turning left, you look over your left shoulder. If you're turning right, you look over your right shoulder. If you're turning right, I know it can seem strange to shoulder check on your right, or at least I thought so when I first started. And I was like, why do I have to check over my right? There's no cars coming. No, but there is people and there is cyclists. So it's actually quite important. And I do that one more so than my left one, I would say, because people can just pop out of nowhere. Backing up. Before you back up, make sure you do a 360 degree vision check. Look all around your vehicle using shoulder checks, mirror checks, and then turn your body to look out the rear view mirror while backing up. Be especially careful when you're backing out of a driveway because it's easy to miss children, pets, pedestrians, cyclists, or people in wheelchairs. If you've been stopped for some time, walk around the back of your vehicle to check that your path is clear. Better yet, try to back into driveways and parking spots so you can drive out facing forward. Um, so it, during the test, they will be checking that you're doing a 360 vision check. You're going to be doing this left to right, always during the test left to right. And it is very important to practice this in a parking lot because it is not that easy to look out the back window and back up in a straight line. And that is typically one of their test um, requirements that you need to be able to back up in a straight line for like a f quite a few meters just to show that you're able to drive straight, backwards and forwards. Um, again, so checking your vehicle before you drive what I do is when I walk up to my car, I just make sure that I don't see anything around it. So then that works as well. Um, so driving tip, before you start to back up, give a quick warning tap on your horn if visibility is limited. So if you really can't see anything, you often see like trucks doing that, like honking when they back up or they have that automatic like beep, 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 beep. That's just to make sure that everybody sees you. I don't typically do this unless I think that someone hasn't seen me, but of course, your driving is up to you, it's gonna be your technique. Crash fact, almost 60% of crashes in BC happen at intersections. So like I was saying, if you're the first one through the light or the last one through the light, you always wanna be aware of the other people because um, you know, left turns or just people running a red, you don't wanna be in that statistic for sure. Observing intersections, look well ahead as you approach an intersection. Check for signs, signals, and other clues about whether you'll need to stop. As you're approaching an intersection, scan the road. If you're crossing, look left, center, right, then glance left again. If an oncoming vehicle is turning left, take extra care. The, the driver may not see you. And also check crosswalks that you intend to cross to make sure they're clear. 
This is also very important. Sometimes you're so focused on the cars and the road and left turns that you totally forget about the pedestrians, which at the end of the day, they're the most vulnerable. And we do have to, they always have the right of way here in BC and we do have to be aware of those pedestrians. Also, people run across the road when they're getting close to the red. So that is another fun surprise. So bushes and larger vehicles are two of the main things that can block your view in an intersection and oncoming traffic. Can you think of some other things that may block your view in an intersection? So during your driver's test, they are going to ask you to park and say, can you point out the hazards in this situation? So for example, if we were this car here and these were our hazards, we would say the bushes and then we could say the large car or the large truck, sorry. And, um, we could say possible pedestrians, right? Coming from the bushes or possibly a car speeding around or even a car speeding up this way. So you just kind of make it up, honestly, <laughs> because you just want to add as many possible hazards because at the end of the day, you don't want to seem like you don't know what you're doing versus um, overdoing it. Stopping and starting again. As you slow down to stop, check your mirrors for traffic behind you. Then make sure you have a clear view of the intersection. You may need to move slowly into the intersection if your view is blocked so you can see clearly before going ahead. So for example, if you were to stop here, there's no way you can see, right? But you have to stop before the stop line, especially during the test. So you're gonna stop here and then you're gonna inch out till you can see. Of course, you're not gonna go into the roadway because then you have the possibility of getting clipped, but you could go all the way to this curb here and then you have a better field of vision. And again, there's no rush. If someone's behind you honking, whatever, don't go. You go when you feel safe to go. At the end of the day, that's their problem. Maybe they left home late and that's just too bad. At the end of the day, it's about your health and your safety. Turning, a shoulder check to make sure a cyclist or other road user hasn't come up beside you. Then scan the intersection just as you begin to move forward. Make sure that your eyes are looking the direction you want to go once you begin your turn. That's just because it's going to make it easier for you to turn into that lane. Hazard perception, you in the driver's seat. You're driving in the rain, using your eyes to gather information ahead to the sides and in your mirrors. Just ahead, there's a cyclist. Further on, a bus has stopped and seems to be letting passengers out. Just behind you is a driver who seems to be moving up too close to you. Suddenly the door of the parked car swings open right in front of the cyclist. Will the cyclist swerve or fall? You take your foot off the accelerator to slow down and get ready to put your foot on the brake. So if there is a bus, people are always gonna try to rip around the bus. As a new driver, I do not recommend that you do that. I would just slow down and wait. And then if you have time, go around because at the end of the day, People that have been driving longer are gonna be faster than you and it's just gonna cause a kerfuffle and it's not worth it. Like this is a very obnoxious scenario, but these can happen, right? And you do wanna be prepared for possible problems like this. Driving safely look, means looking out for hazards. A hazard can be anything in the driving environment that can harm you or other road users. Hazard perception is the skill of identifying these hazards. To share the road safely, train yourself to look for other road users and all objects or road surfaces that might cause problems for you or others in the driving environment. As you drive, think about where the hazards could occur. So here we are in another hazardous situation. So we see there's a construction sign, there's a cyclist, there's a pedestrian, a skateboarder, a bus, a pet. And we also have a motorcycle behind us. So motorcycles have the tendencies to go around the cars like zip zip, <laughs> which is always super fun because we can't do that as easily in a car construction. We're going to have to slow down. This person has their door open. God knows why they're doing that in the middle of the street. It also looks like there's road damage here. So that's going to cause people to swerve as well. Possibly the skateboarder is going to come in here. So you just have to be aware. You see a situation like this, you want to slow down and just see where everything goes and then continue that way. The driving environment includes everything around you, including other road users, road conditions, weather conditions, and all activities on the side of the road that may affect you. So space conflicts. 
That happens when two road users try to move into the same space at the same time. To drive safely, you need to keep the air areas of space called space margins around your vehicle. If you need to stop suddenly, a driver is too close behind you, you could cause a space conflict. Some other space conflicts are a vehicle pulling into your path, a pedestrian st stepping into the road in front of your vehicle, or a vehicle backing out of a driveway. So vehicles, when they back up, they have those little white lights on the back. And so if you ever see those in a parking lot or when someone's backing out of a driveway, always slow down because you never know if they're going to pull out in front of you or wait until you go. Think about, you're about to pull away from the side of the road into traffic. Where should you look and what should you look for? So we kind of talked about this already. If we're pulling away from the road, we're usually going left. And so we're going to look at our left and we're going to look for other cars, cyclists and other possible surprises. So surprises is anything unpredictable is a hazard. A car opening, a car door opening could suddenly surprise a cyclist. If the cyclist swerves to avoid or falls in front of you, you could be surprised as well. To avoid surprises, think well ahead and ask yourself what could possibly happen in the driving environment. Some other surprises are a driver weaving back and forth, a poorly loaded pickup truck, or a skateboarder that may suddenly dart into the road. So for myself, if there is a cyclist in front of me, I always just go behind the cyclist until I have the opportunity to pass them because a lot of the times you just don't know what's going to happen. And of course, they are more vulnerable than you. Um, a driver weaving back and forth, definitely keep your distance. I try to stay behind them until I can pass them and I try to go well ahead of them just so I can avoid whatever possible problem they have going on at that time. Uh, loaded pickup trucks. They often have rocks that can come out and hit you. So again, you want to keep your distance until you can pass them with a good sense of um, distance. Vision blocks. Having your vision blocked is a hazard. Some examples of vision blocks are a bus that blocks your view of people that are about to cross the street, a curve or a hill that doesn't let you see what's ahead, a large truck in the next lane. Be aware that trucks, when they turn, they do need both lanes. So if you think that a truck is turning or they have their signal on, but they're like in the left lane, but they have their right signal on, you're just going to want to hang back. Basically, new driving is all about taking it slow and learning the possible problems that are going to surprise you in the future. And also weather conditions, fog, rain or snow. Be careful when you can't see the whole driving scene. So be extra cautious when anything blocks your view. What could the driver of the blue car miss? So if this blue car is trying to go around here, he might miss that this person is coming here or that the pedestrian is crossing because you can't even see him. So you just have to be very careful. If there were this many people on the intersection that I could see, I would just wait until I was well aware that there was nothing. Sometimes people will give you a honk if it's empty just to let you know that they're letting you go. Um, again, I don't think any of these cars can even see the blue car or care about the blue car. <laughs> so never pass when you're approaching the top of the hill. You never know what hazards may be on the other side of the hill. This I still use if there's a hill and I'm going up it and I can't see the top. I'm just going to go slow because who knows if there's a car stopped on the top or if there's a pet or if something has already happened. Um, so I just try to go slow until I can see the top and then I'll push on my accelerator. Poor road conditions. Poor road surfaces are a hazard because they can affect your traction and steering. Loose gravel. So it seems silly, but actually gravel can be quite scary. When I was a new driver, I turned right onto the gravel going like 40 kilometers an hour and I slid like three feet, just like I would in the snow. And I almost, <laughs> I almost died. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so loose gravel is actually a large hazard. You're not gonna see a lot of it. Mainly it's just driveways. Um, here in BC, we do get a lot of ice on the road, even if there's no snow um, or rain. If it's been heavily raining like it has been this last month, um, you can hydroplane without realizing it. So, And there's different techniques you can use. I'm pretty sure the book is going to go over it just to make sure that you're more steady. But of course, using those two hands um, to control your steering in poor weather conditions is going to be your best bet. So if a paved road suddenly changes into a gravel one, wet or icy patches, or large puddles after a rainstorm. So we're going back to our C, think, do. So now we're thinking. 
Whenever you drive, you, you will see hazards. To make good driving decisions, follow this two-step process. Assess the risk and choose the best solution. So we're assessing the risk. You're in the driver's seat, part one. You're driving down a two-lane highway and just starting into a sharp curve. You can't see very far ahead. In this scene, the risk is moderate. You can't see well ahead, so you need to slow down a little and be cautious. You in the driver's seat, part two. You go into the curve. A driver in the red car pulls out to pass you, even though the highway is divided by a double solid line. Now the risk increases. This is not a good time for that driver to pass because there could be all kinds of hazards just around the curve. To assess how risky the situation is, ask yourself what could happen. What if that driver finds an unexpected obstacle around the curve? He may have to slow down and stop suddenly or pull back into your lane. That means you need to be ready to slow down or stop if necessary. So this really upsets me when people pass me on a curve because like this is saying, it is so dangerous. Who knows if a car is going to be coming in this opposite direction or again, if something has already happened there. So super dangerous. I usually honk at people that do this just to be like, you know, you're wrong. <laughs> Um, so if you're the driver of the blue car, what possible risks do you have in this situation? Basically, you have all the risks because like they said, this person's doing something they should not be doing, but at the end of the day, your lane is still the lane they're going to go back into. So if someone was going to pass me, I would just slow right down so that they have room to go in ahead of me. I know it can be tempting to speed up just to kind of be like, screw you, but it's so dangerous. It's not worth the risk, um, especially on a curve. So you just want to slow down, let them come ahead of you and then continue with your life. Because at the end of the day, if they're passing you, they're going to go faster than you anyways, more than likely. <laughs> You in the driver's seat, part three. As you come around the curve, you see a large truck approach in the approaching lane. The car that is passing you may cut in front of you, trying to get out of the way of the truck. To make matters worse, you see a fallen branch on the road ahead. When you find your yourself in a situation with more than one hazard, what do you do? You need to figure out which hazard is the most dangerous. So in this scenario, of course, the truck is going to be the most dangerous. If you're driving a car, you're never going to win against a truck and you don't even want to try. So at this point, I would just slow right down until the truck has gone past and then you would curve around the branch. Again, you don't want to drive over things in the road, a branch, a bag, anything, because sometimes there could be like something inside that bag that can hurt your tire or just by fluke of Murphy's Law, again, it'll hurt your tire. It's best just to wait and then go around. Choose a solution. You in the driver's seat, part four. Here you are with a car trying to squeeze in front of you. What solutions can you think of? You could slow down, steer out of the way, honk your horn. Again, I do enjoy honking my horn just because I think that if nobody honks at you, you don't know that you did anything wrong. So... It can, like, I don't honestly honk my horn that often. I would say like once every three months, but sometimes people, you know, they get carried away and they just pull stuff that is so dangerous and they should not be doing. So it is good to honk your horn if you think that someone is being very dangerous because they might think twice in the future and that could save someone else's life. All of these solutions involve speed control, steering, st sorry, steering, spaced margins and communication. As you think of possible solutions, try to predict possible outcomes of each one. Here's a slowed down version of what your thinking process could look like. Can I slow down quickly or is the road too slippery? Will I skid? Can my vehicle stop that quickly? Are my brakes and tires tire tread good enough? So this is where it comes down to car maintenance. Um, I know as a new driver, paying money for your car as an oil changes, brakes and tires can seem like a lot of money and that's unnecessary. You're gonna be fine. But you know what, if it's raining, you're not fine. Sometimes if I like press on the gas really soon and it's just like a slippery day, you'll hear your tires spinning. Or if you try to stop, you'll hear like the and like those are not things you want to experience in a dangerous situation like this. Steering, if I steer onto the right shoulder, can I keep control of the car? So I'm just gonna go back to this picture here. So see the side of the road. It doesn't have much room, so I wouldn't advise going onto the side of the road in this scenario. However, if it was kind of like around my area, we usually have kind of like a bike lane situation. So in that case, if there was no cyclist, that would be a safer option. 
um, to avoid anything. But in this scenario, slowing down and waiting is going to be your best bet. Space margins. Do I have enough space to stop safely? Is there space ahead? Space behind? Is there a car behind me that might crash into me if I stop suddenly? Do I have enough space to steer into the shoulder? So that's just what I was saying there. Communication. If I honk the horn, will it help alert the driver? Usually the solution you choose depends on the space, where the space is. Is there enough space in front, to the side? Space will allow you to get out of the situation safely. Some decisions have to be made in seconds. This means you need a lot of practice in assessing the risk and choosing the best solution. Practice by thinking ahead about what you would do in emergency situations. So this is just what I was saying before. If the weather is bad, just kind of think about that beforehand. Um, and you will notice when it rains, a lot of people are going slower and that's because they're doing exactly this. So think about, you are passing an elementary school. A soccer ball rolls into the road about half a block ahead. Assess the risk. What is the major risk? Choose the best solution. What would you do? So with a ball, always comes a kid. So you're going to want to slow way down, possibly stop. Again, don't ever run over anything in the road. A ball, for example, could get stuck in your undercarriage. You're going to drag it for a block. Then you're going to have to get out of your car and try to poke it from underneath your car. So I would just stop in the situation, see where the ball goes, see if a kid comes. So now we're at the do part of our see, think, do. Once you've assessed the risk and have chosen a solution, you need to use your driving skills to perform the maneuver. The do step of the think, do, think, see, think, do involves speed control, steering, space margins, communication. All of your driving maneuvers will combine these four skills, whether you're driving straight, turning at an intersection, or swerving to avoid a hazard. Speed control. You are in the driver's seat. You're driving along a rural road at 80 kilometers an hour. A yellow sign warns that there's a sharp curve ahead. You take your foot off the accelerator and apply the brake to slow down to 30 kilometers before the curve. Again, this is important. You don't want to be braking while you're in a curve. You want to brake before the curve. And then at the midpoint of the curve, you can accelerate slightly and then speed up once more on the straight stretch. This is just because you're going to have more control. If you try to brake in the middle of a curve and something goes wrong, you can easily come into issues. Whereas if you slow down before the curve, you're not going to have those problems. You have more traction when you accelerate. Then you notice something ahead, which looks like a road construction sign. You take your foot off the accelerator to slow down. You're using the tools of speed control, the accelerator and the brake. If you drive a vehicle with standard transmission, you'll also use gears to help you control your speed. Good speed control means maintaining appropriate and steady speeds based on the driving conditions. As a learner, I recommend just doing automatic driving till you kind of get the hang of it and then you can switch in some standard transmission. Um, some people like standard transmission just because they get bored when they're driving or they like to feel the control of the car more or you can even like save more money on gas. Um, typically, I think most people do prefer automatic just because it is the easier option. So we have a crash fact here. In BC 2014, speed was a factor in about 27% of all reported fatal collisions. 4,942 people were injured and 167 died in collisions involving speed. This is just because you don't have that control of your car when you're going too fast. I know when I was an end driver, I was super cautious and now I drive a little bit more so on the fast side. Um, <laughs> most people, they start off driving fast and then they slow down. So it kind of just depends on how things go. You just want to be aware that if you are driving fast, that you are paying a lot of attention because it can be quite dangerous. These speed margins are set for our safety. I do find here in um, BC, they are quite set quite low, but that is my personal <laughs> um, opinion. Appropriate speeds. Speeding is risky, but the safest speed isn't always the slowest speed. So if you're driving slower than the surrounding traffic, other drivers are going to get frustrated and they are going to try to pass you. So this is causing like kind of a road rage scenario. You always want to go at least the posted speed. So if the posted speed is 50, even if it's scary to go 50, you want to go 50 because otherwise you're going to cause more problems and people are going to get quite upset with you. 
So you wanna aim for a speed that's appropriate for the conditions which you are driving. The posted speed is the maximum for the ideal conditions only. Choose a slower speed if the conditions are not ideal. For example, if the roads are slippery or visibility is limited. So for example, if it's raining or snowing and you slow down, people aren't gonna be that upset with you versus if it's a clear day and you're slowing down under the speed limit. So here in BC, unless the speed tells you otherwise, the speed limits are 50 kilometers within cities and towns, 80 kilometers outside of cities and towns, so that's more so like rural areas, and 20 kilometers is the maximum speed in a lane or alleyway within municipalities unless otherwise posted. So for example, if you're in uh, a neighborhood and you're going through an alley, you're gonna wanna go 20. Again, that's because people and cars are coming out at any point. Driving tip, driving at a steady speed saves fuel. Suddenly changing your speed or driving over the speed limit will increase your fuel consumption. So for example, when I drive on the highway, I kind of save gas because I'm going a steady speed, but at the same time, if I'm going over 100, I typically notice that my gas is going faster just because my, uh, I think it's RMPs are quite high. So usually if I'm over two and a half on that gauge, then I'm spending more gas, or if I like slam on the gas to like pull out, pull out somewhere or something, then I'm gonna be using a lot of gas. So it's kind of like saving money if you're able to maintain that speed right away. To keep a steady speed, use your brake and accelerate it smoothly. Driving up to a stop sign quickly and then hitting the brake isn't good for your passengers or your vehicle. It can also cause the driver behind to crash into the rear of your car. To keep your driving speed smooth and steady, you will need to anticipate. When you see a stop sign start to slow down, stand for hazards ahead and use your brakes to slowly stop at the stop sign. So sometimes if there's a stop sign here, you'll notice that there's a sign just up here that will say stop ahead. Usually that stop ahead sign is where you need to start slowing down to make a smooth stop. So when I first started driving, I was very, very conscious of that extra sign here and that was able to um, help myself get better at stopping in a smooth manner and again you don't want all of your passengers to like jerk forward every time you go and stop because that's not cool so you want to prepare yourself when you see a hazard ahead you're going to take your foot off the accelerator cover the brake by resting your foot lightly on the brake without activating it and your car will slow down slightly you will be able to respond more quickly if you must stop. So if I'm not needing to drive fast, I always put my foot on the brake in case something does happen, because you can always switch it back. Again, when you're first driving, it's not as natural knowing which one's gas or brake. So you just want to be aware of that as well. Physics and driving. You need to pay attention to the rules of physics when you drive. Traction. This is the grip that your tires have on the road. Slippery or sandy road surfaces worn tires and under or over inflated tires that don't grab the road will reduce traction. Slow down if you're on poor road surfaces. So when I get my oil change, I get my tires rotated and they also fill them all to the same, um, the same air amount, which helps you save gas and also helps you with your traction. So typically say your tire says up to 50 PSI, because I believe that's what mine is. But I noticed that my um, auto shop only fills it up to 35 PSI. So that's just to allow myself more traction in the winter when your tires are cold. Inertia. This is the tendency for moving objects, in this case, you and your vehicle, to continue moving forward in a straight line. When you brake, inertia tries to keep your car from car moving. When you go around a curve, inertia tries to keep you going in a straight line. The faster you are going, the greater force of inertia. You will notice that sometimes when you brake and then the light turns green and you take your foot off the brake, your car is automatically going to go forward. This is inertia. Gravity. This is the force that pulls everything towards Earth. It's the reason your vehicle slows down when going up a hill and speeds up when coming down. It's important to remember this when you're going downhill because your vehicle will need a longer distance to stop. Center of gravity. This is the point around which all of the object's weight is balanced. The center of gravity for any object can change. For example, a tightrope walker may carry a pole to lower the body's center of gravity and make it easier to balance. 
Most vehicles are built on the same principle principle low enough to the ground so they balance well on hills curves and uneven road surfaces but some vehicles for example some sports utility pickup trucks and camper vans have a higher center of gravity whenever the height of the vehicle or its load rises the center of gravity also rises a vehicle with a higher center of gravity is less stable on uneven road surfaces and is more likely to tip over on a curve at higher speeds. You need to remember this if you're driving one of these vehicles. So this is very true. If you have a car, usually you're pretty safe on curves and all of that because they're quite low to the ground. However, if you're in a Jeep, for example, and you take a curve really fast, the chances of you flipping your car are actually quite high. So you just want to be aware of your car and you'll even feel it when you go around a a curve too fast you'll feel kind of the other side lifting that means you've taken it too fast and you need to reconsider that in the future because again if there was a hazard there you had to slam on your brakes that could flip your car so the blue car has a low center of gravity on the curve the weight shifts to one side but the car remains stable the truck with its large wheels has a much higher center of gravity. On flat surface, it is stable, but when the weight shifts on a curve, the truck may be unstable and roll. Handling curves. When you go around a curve, inertia tries to keep your vehicle going in a straight line, while traction tries to keep your tires sticking to the curved pavement. The faster you travel, the more pressure is exerted on the outside front tire. If you're going too fast, inertia will cause your vehicle to go off the road. If you brake, your vehicle may skid. The problem is increased if the road is slippery or uneven. The best practice is to slow down before the curve and avoid braking into it. If you do start to lose traction in the curve, don't brake. Ease off the accelerator and then gently reapply when you regain traction. Like I was saying, you don't want to brake on a curve. You want to slow down before you go on the curve and then accelerate into the curve once you kind of get a handle on it. You want to straighten your wheel and then accelerate to safe speed. Gear use. When you're driving a vehicle in standard transmission, you need to be able to choose the appropriate gear and shift smoothly. You need to practice the coordination with the clutch, accelerator, and gear shift. It is illegal to coast downhill in neutral or with the clutch in. You still need to be able to be in gear to safely control your vehicle. Steering. You in the driver's seat. You're about to make a left turn at a major intersection. You're a bit nervous because you haven't been driving long. You see a gap in oncoming traffic, so you let your eyes guide you as you steer into a smooth arc ending in the correct lane. Okay, I'm sorry. I actually have to run to the bathroom because I drank a lot of tea. One second. Thanks for waiting, I am back. Steering, like any skill, takes practice. Practice will help you coordinate your hands, your eyes, and let you drive in a straight line or a smooth arc. The two main principles of good steering are controlling the wheel and maintaining good road position. So 
when you're turning into a lane, you just want to look in the center of the lane and a little bit ahead, and that will help you like reposition without like overcorrecting. Because if you're looking directly in front of you, it's harder to go in the lane. Whereas if you look like a few feet ahead, your car is automatically going to follow your vision, if that makes sense. So warning, loading up your vehicle with extra weight can cause it to steer very differently, especially during curves. Don't overload your vehicle and check your owner's manual for weight limit information. Very true. When I go camping, I notice that my vehicle drives completely differently. And also um, when you're loading, you're going to want to load closer to the front than to the back because that's going to give your car better steering. So for example, if you have a truck bed, you're going to want to load it closer to where you're sitting rather than behind because that's going to throw off your weight balance in the back there. Controlling your wheel. Keep both hands on the outside of your wheel. If you drive with your hands inside the wheel, your hands could be injured in a crash. You may sometimes have to steer with only one hand when you change gears or use dashboard control, but try to use two hands when possible. This gives you better control and also shortens your response time when you see a hazard. Where should you put your hands? Imagine that your steering wheel is a clock. You wanna put your hands at equal height at the nine o'clock and three o'clock position. So if this is a clock, three o'clock would be here and nine o'clock would be here. So you're always wanting to do the equal hand position just because that's going to give you more control. Ten and two, I'm not a huge fan of because that's quite high up on your wheel. Um, but again, it's whatever feels most comfortable. If there's an airbag in your steering wheel, the nine and three o'clock or even the eight and four o'clock position may be better than the ten and two. This is because your hands could hit your face if the airbag goes off when they're in the 10 and 2 position. So like I said, definitely not my favorite, but I have seen people doing it as well. Keeping good road position. Steer the vehicle in a smooth line so that there is little side to side movement when you're driving. The best way to do this is look well ahead in the direction you want to go. Your peripheral vision will help you center your vehicle and keep you moving in a straight line. When you turn, look well ahead in the position, or sorry, in the direction that you're turning, and this will help you turn in a smooth arc. Just like I was saying, you're gonna go where your vision is. So um, this is just the best way to help you smoothen it out right away. Space margins. You in the driver's seat. You're driving behind someone who's traveling at 30 kilometers an hour in a 50 kilometer zone. You wouldn't mind it so much, but you're late for an appointment. There's no chance to pass on this residential street. You think it might be a good idea to pull up closer so the driver, closer behind to get the driver to hurry up. Do not do this. <laughs> Usually if someone is going slow, it either means that they are lost and they're gonna stop or turn at any point, um, or that they are just looking for their turn. So you're gonna turn right or left. Um, tailgating, never the answer. If you can't pass, yeah, just wait until you can. Or you can honk if you want, but you wanna be careful with the honking because that can aggravate some people and you don't wanna have like an actual <laughs> fist fight in the road because you honked at someone who's having a bad day possibly, right? So tailgating or following too closely behind the vehicle in front is a major cause of crashes. If you tailgate, the vehicle in front can block your view of hazards ahead Worse, if the vehicle stops suddenly, you have no time to slow down and stop safely. If you rear on the other driver, you will be held responsible for the crash. Some people as well, if you're going to tailgate them, they'll do what's called a brake check. And that's where they slam on their brakes to show you that you, they think that you're following too closely. As a new driver, that's not something you want to experience because you're not going to be prepared for that. And it's quite scary just in general. So tailgating, never the answer. You can always turn and go a different way as well, right? Driving tip. When you stop behind another vehicle at an intersection, leave about one car length between your vehicle and the vehicle ahead. This way you will have room to move if you need it. Allow more space when stopped directly behind a large vehicle. So with large vehicles, typically they can't see you if you can't see their mirrors. So for example, if I'm stopped behind a large semi truck and I can't see their like side mirrors, that means that more than likely they can't see me at all. So I'm going to keep a wider distance be behind them because if they do need to turn or back up for some reason, 
that's going to be me in the way. And if so, the person behind me hasn't left room, then that's just going to cause a kerfuffle. At that point, you're going to want to honk, 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 honk. Because like I said, if they can't see you, then you don't exist. <laughs> so um, I know it seems like a lot. It seems like driving super scary. But these situations obviously don't happen every single time you drive. And the more you drive, the better prepared you are. But yeah, always leave extra room because... Again, you never know what's going to happen. Stopping. Stopping your vehicle is more than just pressing on the brake paddle. Try stopping, sorry, total stopping distance is the distance your vehicle will travel from the moment you see a hazard, decide to stop, and place your foot on the brake pedal until you stop. When you see a problem ahead while you're driving, it will take you about three quarters of a second to see, think, and another three quarters of a second to do. Only then will your vehicle begin to slow down. This is why it's important to allow enough space in the front. So when you're following behind a car, you always want to follow the two second rule. So you want to leave a safe following distance between your vehicle and the vehicle in front. You'll need at least two seconds of space in good, good weather and good road conditions. Increase your following distance to three on a high speed road, like a highway, or four in a bad weather condition or uneven slippery roads. Allow at least three seconds following distance when you're behind a large vehicle that could block your vision or a motorcycle that could stop quickly. It is also a good idea to keep at least three seconds following distance if another vehicle is following close behind you, or when you're following another vehicle onto an unpaved road where dust or gravel may be in the air. So. It's gonna be kind of hard to measure that three second space. Typically what I do is I try to allow three car lengths. So then um, if I need to stop, then I have room to stop. If it's good road conditions, again, two car lengths. If I can see everything that's going on, I'm not as concerned. If I am concerned, I'm just gonna back off a little bit. So on the highway, they're just giving you a recommendation to measure that three second space by picking an object like the sign um, and then kind of measuring it with the car and then you can count it, right? So like 1,000 or 1,001, 1,002, or like some people do like one Mississippi, two Mississippi. And then when you reach the object, you say three. Now you are knowing that you are keeping that three seconds following space. Um, yeah, so this is a way that you could totally do it. I have never done this, <laughs> but if you find this helpful, of course. So we're just gonna read this blurb here. Total stopping distance is the distance your vehicle will travel from the moment you notice a hazard until the moment your vehicle stops. You need time to see, think, and do before your brakes even begin to slow down your vehicle. Braking distance depends on the speed, your vehicle, and road conditions. Always allow enough following distance. So for example, right now, I do have an older car. So I know that my brakes aren't as sensitive as say my partner's car who's newer. So I know that if I'm stopping in my car, I'm gonna need a lot more distance than if I'm stopping in his car. So when you're first driving, it's nice to kind of stay in the same car so that you're aware of all of that before you start mixing in other cars because yeah, again, you just have to be very aware of your stopping distance and your stopping abilities. So they're just giving you a scenario here. The driver sees a tree fall. So now you're thinking what to do. And now you're braking. And now this is the time it takes you to brake. And this is where your car stops and this is where the tree is. So this is where we're kind of saying that you need to be aware of what's going ahead of you. So this is why I like to look like one intersection ahead because you can see things like this before you get to this area. And then you're like, oh no. I need to stop. See, this isn't gonna be enough room to stop, which is why it's so important to look ahead. Space behind. What do you do when someone's tailgating you? You can't control the space behind you in the same way that you can control the space ahead of you. So it's a good idea to slow down slightly to increase your space ahead. This way, if you have to stop, you have more time to stop slowly and there will be less chance of the person behind you crashing into you. Another option is to move into another lane or to pull over to the side and let's let the tailgater pass. Um, so yeah, so if you're in the left lane, which is typically the fast lane and you are going slower than the people behind you, you must go to the right. Like people that stay in the left lane and go slow are just causing problems to begin with. 
Um, but if there is no other lane and you're going the speed limit and this person is still tailgating you, typically what I like to do is I do slow down because at the end of the day, they're probably going to pass you regardless of the lines on the road, because if they're tailgating you, they obviously don't care that much about the road. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll just slow down and be like, feel free to pass if you're going to be tailgating me this way. So warning, if you're turning left off the highway onto a driveway or a side road, watch your mirrors and make sure that you have plenty of space behind you. The cars behind may not prepare, be prepared to slow down for you. So like I said, if someone's going slow, this could be why, because they're looking for their turn. So that's also important to be aware of. Space beside. Keep at least one meter of clear space on each side of your vehicle when you're driving. When you're passing pedestrians, cyclists, or other vehicles, allow as much room as possible, at least one meter and more if you're going at a faster speed. Increase your side margins even more when visibility or road conditions are poor. So yeah, you just want to be aware of the sides of your vehicle. You don't want to be too close to either side just in case something does happen. Lane positions. When you're deciding where to position your vehicle in the lane, there are several things to consider. On a two lane road, stay fairly close to the center line so the other vehicles do not move into your lane space. In a curb lane, stay well away from the hazards on the side such as car doors and others that may open. In most lanes, drive nearer to the center of the lane and avoid other driver's blind spots. So the reason they're saying this is you're on this side, right? You're on the left side of the car. So this middle lane, you're gonna be able to see how close you are to that. So that's gonna be your safest bet. Obviously you're gonna be aware not to go into the other lane because you're right there. And typically what a good tip is that I learned when I was learning to drive is your left knee is about where your left tire is. So you're just gonna to wanna to be aware that you do have that little bit of space here. So you're not gonna go into the other lane, but it's easier to control the space on your left than it is on your right. Because of course you can't always see the line on your right, depending on what car or mirrors you have. So go with what you know, which is gonna be your left side of the car and the center lane. So that's just why they're kind of saying that. On a multi-lane road, the right lane is often the safest one to choose. It keeps you away from the oncoming traffic and it's less likely that another driver will tailgate you. Like I said, if you're gonna go slow, go in the right lane. As a new driver, that might be your pace, low and slow, totally fine. Just don't go in the left lane because then you're gonna cause some issues and you're also probably gonna get honked at. Um, so you're also gonna to wanna to try to leave yourself an escape route when you're driving on a multi-lane highway. Then if something happens in the front, you can pull to the other lane to avoid trouble. Um, so yeah, so driving in the middle lane is pretty safe because say if there was this box here, you can choose right or left depending on where you are. So if I'm wanting to like go off the highway at some point, I usually use the middle lane because it's not quite as far to travel to get off the highway. Um, so yeah, it's just something you need to plan for. Always remember that if you are going to miss your turn off, for example, that's fine. You can just go to the next exit and continue from there. There's no reason to get stressed out when you're driving. There's always something you can do later, right? It may cost you extra five, 10 minutes, but it doesn't cost you your life. And at the end of the day, that's what it comes down to your safety and other safety. <laughs> okay, choosing a safe gap. You in the driver's seat, you're waiting at a stop sign. The traffic seems endless. Just when you think it's safe to cross the intersection, another car comes into view. What would you do? Um, so as a new driver, it can be quite hard to kind of gauge the speed that people are going at. Sometimes even now I'll be sitting at the stoplight and I'll be like, do I go? Do I not go? And I'll be like, no. And then I'll be like, oh my goodness, they were going so slow. I could have gone like three times. But at the end of the day, that safe gap is just your safety, right? So is it really worth to rush something that you're not sure of and then, you know, get tied up in an accident, which is going to cost you a couple of hours, possibly your life, or wait an extra like minute to get a safe gap? That's totally fine. At the end of the day, your safety. So driving tip, did you know that in the ideal conditions, it takes most vehicles stopped at the intersection about two seconds per lane to go straight across or five seconds to turn right and get up to 50 kilometers, seven seconds to turn left to get up to 50 kilometers, 
and allow extra time if you need to cross several lanes. Remember to add an extra two seconds for safety. So this five seconds is something you need to remember before you cut someone off. Um, you could be like, oh, they're going slow, but you have to remember that you're going from a full stop up to speed, and that can be dangerous for them if they're not paying attention. The space you need to get across an intersection safely or to merge into the line of traffic is called a gap. Deciding on whether the gap is big enough to be safe is not always going to be easy. You need to consider several things. The speed of traffic, the time it will take you to do your maneuver, the time it will take your vehicle to accelerate to the speed of traffic flow. Be careful not to underestimate the speed of approaching motorcycles or bicycles. They are often traveling much faster than they appear to be. So this is just because they're smaller, right? You kind of assume that they're not going that fast, but some cyclists, I think they can go up to like 20 or 30 kilometers an hour, depending on how experienced they are. And motorcycles can just go so fast. So it just depends on the person that's driving it. So here we have a bit of a scenario. The driver of the blue car and the driver of the station wagon may have a problem if either of them moves out of the correct lane position that they are turning into. In this situation, you time your turn so that you won't have a space conflict with the other driver. If there's any doubt about who should go first, the driver making the left turn should yield. So um, yeah, so this person has the right of way because this is kind of like their lane to go into, whereas the left person is crossing their lane. So this person's gonna have right of way, this person has second right of way. Typically, when you turn from this lane, you're supposed to turn into that lane. However, if this person is trying to go into a store here or something, they might just turn directly into the left lane. And that's where we're going to have a problem if they both turn at once. If I am doing this, just seeing the cyclist here, I'm not going to turn at all if I'm this car. And if you're this car, you should be OK, depending on if the cyclist is behind you or on the sidewalk. So I would typically let this car turn and then let the cyclist do whatever they're going to do. And then I would turn. Communication, you in the driver's seat. Your car is at the stop sign and you're waiting to cross the intersection. The intersection is clear except for a car approaching on the left. Its right signal is on. If this car turns right before it reaches you, you can safely cross the intersection right now. But the driver isn't slowing down and they're not pulling to the right. What would you do? You wait. Always that's gonna be the answer, you wait because sometimes people have just turned into this lane. Their signal is still going. They haven't noticed it. If they're not slowing down, it's very 50-50 whether or not they're going to turn or if they're going to keep going straight. It just depends on how slow they like to go before they turn. For example, myself, I typically take turns at 30 kilometers an hour, but you will also see other people that stop completely before they turn. So you just want to be aware of that um, I mean, if they're going pretty fast, just wait, see what they do. You can even wait till about here. And if you notice them slowing down at that point, you could go, or you could just wait until they get all the way to whatever they're doing. In this scene, the driver is confusing you by giving mixed messages. Their turn signal in indicates they're planning to turn, but the lane position and the speed of their vehicle suggests that they plan on going right, or sorry, plan on going straight. In this situation, it's better to wait and see what they do before crossing the intersection. Sharing the road means effectively understanding the tools and communication and using them effectively. Turn signals. Your primary communication tools are your turn signals. Always use your turn signals to let people know if you are planning to turn, change lanes, pull out, or pull over. Now, just be aware, a lot of people do not use their turn signals, and it's actually one of my biggest pet peeves because like this says, it is your primary communication tool. And if someone's not using it, you're basically just waiting until you know what they do. So when you are using your turn signal, be timely. Signal well ahead to give other road users plenty of time and warning. Um, so just something I was talking about in the last chapter. If you're worried about getting into another lane, if you turn your signal on ahead of time, that's going to give other people a hint and then they may leave room for you. Be clear, do not apply your turn signal too soon as it confuses other people. If you plan to turn right at the intersection and there are a number of driveways or lanes before you reach that intersection, wait until you're close enough that people can actually see where you're planning to turn. 
So when we were talking about that like stop sign and then that prepare to stop sign, so just kind of imagine that space is where you're going to want to put on your turn signal. So when you start to slow down, that's when you're putting on your turn signal so that everybody knows, okay, they're going to turn right or left. Because yeah, if you turn it on too soon, they, they may think that you're turning into a driveway or into a different lane and then it just gets confusing. Mean what you say. Your turn signal is designed to switch off after you've made your turn but sometimes it doesn't. Make sure that your signal has canceled after your turn so it doesn't give the wrong message. There are times when an automatic turn signal is hard to see. For example, if you're pulling out from a line of parked cars. In these situations, use a hand signal in addition to a turn signal. So yeah, um, when someone's on a bike, they always have to use hand positions. And actually, when you do your driver's test, the first thing they ask you is to test your lights and to do these hand positions, just to show that you are aware of what these mean and how to use them. So in a car, when you're signaling to turn left, you're just putting your arm straight out the window because that's the way you're gonna go if you're turning left. If you're going right, because you obviously can't stick your hand out the right window, you're just gonna put your hand up. So that means you're gonna turn right. See a cyclist, because they obviously can put up their right hand, they just put up their right hand typically. Now, if we're stopping, we're showing our palm to the back. So we're showing that we're going to stop and that's the palm back down. So that's a bit easier to remember. Lights. Your vehicle has different types of lights to help you see and be seen. The lights that you use most for communication are brake lights, backup lights, and hazard lights. Brake lights. These are visible when the brake is applied. When you see these lights on a car ahead, you know that the driver is slowing down and perhaps planning to stop. Let others know that you intend to slow down or stop by tapping lightly on your brakes. This will activate brake lights. Um, so yeah, brake lights, super, super important. If they're ever out, you definitely want to replace them ASAP because that is how people know that you're going to stop and that's how they stop safely without rear-ending you as well. Driving tip. Watch for backup lights when you are driving in a parking lot. Not only do they warn you that you need to slow down, they also tell you where you may need or where you may find a parking space. So backup lights automatically turn on when you put your car in reverse and it shows that the driver is backing up or intends to back up. And there, those again are those little white lights and they are very helpful to watch for in parking lots especially. Oh yeah, here's a picture. Fog lights. Fog lamps should only be used in place of or with headlights if atmospheric conditions such as fog make the use of headlamps disadvantage. So um, I'm thinking that they mean high beams for fog lights because I don't think I specifically have fog lights. When you are driving in fog, you wanna play around with your lights a little bit just to see what increases your visibility. Depending on how bad the fog is, sometimes you have to drive even just 30 kilometers an hour because if you can't see very far in front of your car, you're going to want to be extra careful in case an animal or something pops out. The lights on the back of your vehicle can tell you a lot about what the vehicle is about to do. In this Australia, Ist Istril I can't say that word for some reason. In this picture, the vehicle's backing up and your brake lights are gonna be these red lights typically as well. Hazard lights, these let people know that you have stopped for an emergency. Truck drivers use them to warn that they are traveling well below the speed limit. Um, so for example, if you have car trouble, like you can feel your car is doing something funky or not quite sure what's happening, or even um, for example, you're driving up a hill in an old car, I automatically put on my hazards so that people know that I'm not going to be going fast or that I'm not sure what's happening because then that gives them the opportunity to pass you without getting upset and tailgating you. Horn. Horn is a useful communication tool if it's used properly. For example, if you see someone pulling out of a driveway without looking, a light tap on the horn will let the driver know you're there. Only use the horn when it gives a useful signal to other drivers and helps prevent a crash. Um, careful with the horn because it's not typically something people use a lot here in BC. So if you do honk on it aggressively, it can actually scare someone and cause them to panic. So if it's a situation where I think someone might panic if I honk the horn, I don't do it just because I don't want to add that extra hazard to the situation. Um, but like a light tap, like doop, 
that's fine because that won't typically scare anyone. And then they kind of get an idea like, oh, someone's here. Driving tip. When you carry a load that extends behind your vehicle, attach a red flag at the end of the load as a warning to other drivers. So this is actually something that you can get ticketed for if you don't do. So sometimes you'll see those like pickup trucks with like big sticks sticking out and they'll have like a red or a yellow flag on the end. That's just because that is the law. And um, it kind of helps people be aware. Like if I'm stopping behind you, I have to leave space for your stick as well as your car. Eye contact. You can often communicate with other road users just by using your eyes. When you stop for pedestrians, make eye contact so that they know that you have seen them and it is safe for them to cross. Do the same for other drivers, motorcycle riders, cyclists, when you have stopped at an intersection. This can be quite handy. Um, it's always good to pay attention, you know, look at the driver and see what's happening. If you've been a pedestrian in the past, you'll definitely notice that eye contact is important when you're crossing an intersection, like for example, that just has a stop sign and no crosswalk, because then you know that they've seen you. Think about a parked car starts to pull out just in front of you. How can you use your do skills, speed control, steering and space margins and communication? So um, if a parked car pulls out in front of you and you're doing like 50 kilometers an hour, definitely you're going to want to like do a quick honk, slow down and keep both hands on the steering wheel and just try to add those um, space margins as possible. Because typically if they're going from parked to full speed, it's going to take them a few seconds, so you're going to need to slow down a few seconds. Body language. Waving your hand to let other drivers proceed or pedestrian cross in front of you is generally not a good idea. The other driver or pedestrians may face hazards you can't see. So for example, you're in a two-laned um, road and there's a person waiting to turn left in front of you and you're you're wanting to help them out right so you're like oh no come 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 but then all of a sudden someone on your right just speeds out there now that person's not aware right because they've they followed your direction they think they're safe to go and they didn't see that other car coming mind you neither did you but at the same time now it's on you rather than on them so it's always good to let other drivers make their own calls unless they like absolutely can't see and like everybody's stopped but yeah generally as a rule of thumb it's just not worth it vehicle language you can tell a lot about what a driver is going to do by watching their vehicle language if a vehicle moves over in the lane, the driver may be planning to change lanes or turn. If the vehicle slows down when approaching a corner, the, driveway, the driver may be planning a turn. When you see a parked vehicle with its wheels turned out, the vehicle may be planning to pull out into traffic. So yeah, this is something that's going to come with experience. I for sure didn't know anything about vehicle language going into this. Now, if I see people doing weird things in the lanes, I always slow down because I kind of figure that something like this is going to happen. So again, don't be too tough on yourself. You're a new driver. Just survive. <laughs> Using think, see, sorry, see, think, do. Research shows that new drivers often panic and even freeze in an emergency. You can avoid this by giving yourself plenty of time and space to react and practice doing the see, think, do strategy. If you're practice, or if you're driving at a safe speed, look well ahead, keep alert and focused. You should have time to see problems coming up and think of solutions and take actions that will help you keep safe. I think that is it. Wow, we're done. <laughs> um, but yeah, so basically, yeah, look ahead and go slow. Those are going to be your biggest tips out of this chapter. Thank you.